So, Chamber of Secrets. Um, I'm going to try and finish today. Probably won't. Uh, and I think that's okay that we we can maybe go over to um, Wednesday, maybe half the period. Um, but then we'll start, we'll definitely start Prisoner of Azkaban on Friday. And since we have spring break coming after that, definitely have Prisoner of Azkaban entirely finished by the 11th when we come back. Because um, we're probably not going to go beyond the 11th. So we're going to have to finish Prisoner of Azkaban on that Monday. If we don't, I'll post you know a video lecture for the completion of it so that we can get into Goblet of Fire. Because only four days, four Monday, Wednesday, Friday days for Goblet of Fire is not going to be enough. Because um, it's like three of these. And it's a lot more dense. I mean... First book, second book, they're pretty fluffy. I mean, they're marshmallow, okay? Um, part of the reason for that is because she's still setting up the world. She's setting up the whole Harry Potter universe, so to speak. And we're still learning stuff. Um, I mean, she's doing that throughout the remainder of the books, too. But once she creates Hogwarts, creates our understanding... Um, we can then kind of leave that aside as background noise, so to speak. So where I said we would pick up today is, I think it's pages 62 and 63. When Harry, Ron, the, the Weasleys, Hermione, they're all at Flourish and Blotts. They're there to get their school books and school supplies. And we see the Malfoys run into the Weasleys. Now, if you watched the video lecture, what does Malfoy mean? Bad faith. Okay. What does Draco mean? Dragon. Okay. Mr. Malfoy's name is Lucius, which has as its root looks or light. Okay. It's a good name, but he's not. <laughs> and the name Malfoy doesn't mean, you know, um, that it's bad faith in the Malfoys, it means they have bad faith or wrong faith. What do the Malfoys put their faith in? Well, we're going to hear about it right in this passage on pages 62 and 63. Okay? So, we see Malfoy, top of 62, well, 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 Arthur Weasley, etc. And notice Mal, uh, Arthur nods Lucius, okay, and we hear a little bit of talk between them, and Malfoy makes the comment, dear me, what's the use of being a disgrace to the name of wizard if they don't even pay you well for it? Now, what does that imply? He'll do anything for money. He'll do anything for money. Pay me enough, you know, and he'd slit his grandmother's throat probably, okay? And notice, Arthur then replies and says, we have a very different idea of what disgraces the name of wizard. Now, they're both from what kind of family? Pure bloods. What's the difference? Arthur likes uh, muggles, so to speak, and uh, Lucius. Okay. Everything has to be perfect. Weasleys get like, get along with, fraternize with, because, I mean, they're with Hermione and her parents. Muggles, what about the, the Malfoys? They only care about purebloods. That's part of their bad faith. Okay, And so what happens when Malfoy then says, the company you keep, Weasley, and I thought your family could sink no lower. Why does he think their family could sink no lower? They're poor. He doesn't mean sink like morally sink, you know, because of actions that he means you're poor, okay? And what happens? Arthur just launches at him. I mean, it's one thing if you make a comment about me, but when you attack my family, etc. So Hagrid wades in and breaks him up. And we get this passage on page 63, right in the middle. Okay. Notice Malfoy gives a book that looks like this one. You know, it's falling apart 
gives um, Jenny Weasley her book back, which she pulled out of her cauldron. It was all battered, torn. And he says, here, girl, take your book. It's the best your father can give you. Notice what he's doing there. If your father were a decent father, he'd give you a good book. He'd give you a new book, etc. And Hagrid says, you should have ignored him, Arthur. Rotten to the core. Okay, he's talking about the Malfoys. Rotten to the core. The whole family. Everyone knows that. No Malfoy's worth it. He goes on and says, no Malfoy's worth listening to her. Bad blood. Rotten to the core. Bad blood. Let's get out of here. Now, before we talk about this, how does... Molly Weasley respond to her husband's defense of their family honor. She was concerned with Lockhart not. I mean, brawling in public, really. But she's more concerned about what Gilroy Lockhart thought. Come back to this. What does Hagrid mean? Okay, go else. Step aside for a moment, though it's entirely applicable to here. The 2016 election, before the election actually occurred, Hillary Clinton gave a speech to some donors where she used two terms that were then later used against her by Republicans. Anybody know or remember what those two terms were? Deplorables. She called Republicans deplorables and irre. Deemable. Okay, now deplorable is pretty bad. This word's a lot worse than this one, however. Because what does it mean? Can't be fixed. Can't be redeemed. Go to the Lord of the Rings. Who's this? Not Gollum. What does Gandalf say at the very beginning? I don't have much hope that he can be cured. But he has some. Orcs. Orcs are irredeemable because of how twisted they have been by Sauron and Morgoth before him. Okay? Rotten to the core means this. To the core means everything from the inside out is bad blood. What do you do with bad blood? Drain it. Get rid of it. Okay. Hagrid is saying this about the Malfoys. There is nothing good about the Malfoys. Okay. Reason I'm emphasizing this is I want you to consider this as we go through the next five books. Is there, does Rowling portray anybody as being totally rotten to the core, or even totally bad blood. At the end of book seven, she's going to make it clear, no, not even Voldemort is this. And if your only experience of the Harry Potter story is the films, that gets removed from the films. The idea that Voldemort is redeemable. He's totally removed from the films. Okay. The films become totally about Harry's vengeance against Lord Voldemort. The books are the exact opposite. Harry offers him redemption in that seventh book. Okay? So, we go on, and it's time to leave for Hogwarts. September 1st rolls around. Harry and the Weasleys show up at um, 
King's Cross, and Harry and Ron, for some reason, can't get through. So Ron comes up with the bright idea, notice it is Ron's idea, of getting to Hogwarts how? Flying his father's flying Ford Anglia, okay? Which you can't get in the United States. I've seen him over in the UK many times. And so they fly to Hogwarts. What's part of the problem of flying Arthur's Ford Anglia? It's not always invisible. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. You know, when it comes back visible, you smack on the dashboard and, and it goes invisible again. But as we will find out when they finally arrive, they are seen multiple times. Okay. So they arrive. They don't land very well. They land in the Whomping Willow. Okay. And... Who welcomes them? Snape. Snape. Page 77, 78. They get up to the hall. They're looking in the window at the great hall. They're seeing everybody, all the students, lined up at their tables, eating. They look beyond the tables to the high table. And Snape's seat is empty. Ron says, maybe he's ill, bottom of 77. Harry, maybe he's left. Or Harry thinks because he missed out on the defense against the dark arts job again, right? Because what happened at the end of the previous book? What happened to the previous Dada professor? He's dead, okay? Ron, or maybe he got sacked. I mean, everyone hates him little tap on the shoulder, or maybe he's waiting to hear why you two didn't arrive on the school train. So Snape's been listening to all this. So Snape takes them to his dungeon, and they try to explain. Snape won't hear any of it. Dumbledore shows up. McGonagall's like, why didn't you send an owl? And what's Harry thinking? One, yeah, that's a good idea. Why not I think of that? Where is London in relation to Hogwarts? A long ways away, right? It takes several hours by train to get to Hogwarts. That gives us an idea geographically of where Hogwarts is. London's down here, is down here. Canterbury's over here. It's about an hour, maybe 90 minutes if it's a slow train from London. Oxford's about 90 minutes away hour to 90 minutes. Cambridge is about an hour. Okay. Edinburgh is four to five hours, depending upon the train. Glasgow is about six to seven hours. In other words, Hogwarts is north of Edinburgh and Glasgow. What that generally means is it's in the highlands of Scotland. Okay. So that's a, that's a long train ride. How fast can Hedwig fly? If they're there that morning to catch the 11 o'clock train, how long is it going to take Hedwig to fly from there to Hogwarts? Longer than it would take the train to get there. It's going to take a long time. Okay. Better like one to two systems. Do they have other forms of communication? They don't know the Patronus yet. Next book. What else? And Harry doesn't even know how to send a Patronus. He, he will conjure a Patronus in book three. What else? Flu powder, we're going to discover later, but he's not familiar with that yet. Okay. Apparating, have to be 17. They can't do that yet. Okay. Telephone, Hogwarts doesn't have one. Hogsmeade doesn't have one. Okay. So they're thinking, let's fly the car. So, Harry gaped at her. Oh, yeah, sh I should have. I didn't think. McGonagall, bottom of page 80. <laughs> That's obvious. Well, where in the novels does Harry really think a lot? Who gets Harry through the final test 
previous book, After the Trap Door. Hermione, what's the test? It's logic. It's not potions. It's logic. Okay. Ron helps him get past the chess set, right? which is also what? Even though Ron doesn't think of it this way. Chess is logic. It's logic and strategy. How, how would Harry have done on that? Be dead. <laughs> would have been captured very, very quickly. Okay. So notice, by the way, in that first book, what does it take for Harry to get to the chamber where the Philosopher's Stone is held? Teamwork. It takes his friends. He can't do it on his own. And that's going to be an idea. It's going to come up later on and be hashed around a bit. Right? So, Dumbledore says, explain why you did this. And Harry finishes, and Ron's like, okay, we'll go get our stuff. Because Ron's thinking, we're toast, man. We're expelled. We're out of here. McGonagall says, no. And before McGonagall can give Harry and Ron, or let me rephrase that, before McGonagall can take points from Harry and Ron for their school, Harry, page 82, says, McGonagall starts, speaking of Gryffindor, because she tells Ron, your sister's in Gryffindor too. And speaking of Gryffindor, and Harry cuts her off. Okay, now, at Hogwarts, do you ever really cut off a professor when they're speaking? No, you don't. It's two especially, you don't cut into. Snape or McGonagall, okay? Harry, professor, when we took the car, term hadn't started. So, so Gryffindor shouldn't really have points taken from it, should it? She gives him a piercing look, but he was sure she'd almost smiled. Why? Why had she almost smiled? Louder? Is it that she thought it was funny? Yeah, the kid's showing some moxie here. He's showing some, you know what? <laughs> what else? I mean, it's not only boldness. It's clever. Thinking. Way to go, Harry. That was a smart move. She goes, no, I'm not going to take any points, but you guys, you're both getting detention. Harry's like, Phew, fine, detention. I mean, because really, how bad is detention? What happened the last time he got detention? <laughs> he got to go in the Forbidden Forest with Hagrid. For, what's the first part of that word? Forbidden. Tell any 11-year-old, you can't do this. What are they going to try to do? We're 12, 13, 14, 15, 15, 18, 20, 30, 50. Thou shalt not. And, you know, it's more to see. <laughs> okay? So what detentions do they get? Jump ahead a little bit. Ron has to scrub trophies clean, polish, and Harry gets to answer fan mail with Gilderoy Lockhart. Okay? So, they get up to the common room, and because everything that happens at Hogwarts is a secret, what happens? They don't know the password. Well, they don't know the password, but they do get up. They get mobbed, right? I mean, Seamus and everyone's like, man, this is totally great. How cool would... Okay. So, they meet Gilderoy Lockhart again. They met him at Flourish and Blotts. How did he come across there? Excellent casting, by the way. Yeah. I mean, the, the casting here was fantastic in the film. I, I can't not read Snape's lines and hear Alan Rickman's voice in my head. Okay. I, I personally don't think Rickman was as good, but um, what's his name? Lockhart. What's the actor's name? Director... Kenneth Brown. Kenneth Brown was, was superb. So what's their first defense against the dark arts class like? Chaos. Chaos. Why? He lets the Cornish Pixies out. Okay. 
What does he first do? He gives him a quiz about himself. Okay. 80 some questions. Who gets 100? Why? She's obsessed. What do you mean? She's a fangirl. She's a fangirl. Oh, he's so what? What has he won more than anybody else? Which weekly's most charming smile award? Three years running. Three years in a row. Notice, he puts emphasis on that and not on what other quote-unquote award that he won. What kind of order of Merlin does he have? Third class, and it's honorary. You got the bronze, which means what? Loser. I mean, I don't... Take your pick. Take your sport. If you come in third place, that means what? You lost. Okay? You're not the best. So, and his is an honorary. If you get an honorary PhD from a university, it means you didn't earn it. It means you didn't do the work that produced it. Okay? So... At the end of that class, who does end up capturing the Cornish pixies and putting them away? And Ron and Harry, I mean, they, they help too. What about Neville? He's swinging from the chandelier, yeah, okay. And page 103, it's the first time we really Get this idea introduced. Ron says, can you believe him? Hermione, he just wants to give us some hands-on experience. Harry, hands-on? Hermione, he didn't have a clue what he was doing. Hermione, rubbish. You've read his books. Well, first of all. You don't even know how to read. Really? <laughs> Debatable. Have they read his books? It's the first day of class. No, they haven't read his books yet. Look at all those amazing things he's done. And Ron qualifies that. He says he's done. What do Hermione's words really say? If it is what? If it is printed in a book, then it must be true. Then it's true. Ron says, maybe, maybe not. Well, we get to the end of the books, and what do we discover? The end of this book, what do we discover? Maybe not. Yeah, it's not true. None of it's true. Okay? Why did she introduce this idea? She did, uh, books should be approached with caution, because Book, books have power. Books should be approached with caution, because books... Or words have power. How do we know words have power? Wingardium Leviosa. Words are spells, right? The old, the word that from which we get spell, modern English spell, not like to put the letters in correct order, comes from the old English word spell, which one meaning of it is simply word. Another meaning of it is like Gandalf will say, word of power. That is, like we think of a witch's spell. Okay? It is a word that can control something. The idea she's introducing in this book, particularly, is one has to be careful what one reads. How do we know that's an important idea? It's um, continued throughout the rest of the series. Okay, it is very much continued throughout the rest of the series. What book does Harry read in this story? Tom Riddle's Diary. But the book's blank. Yeah, but he still reads it. Because he's reading. Harry thinks, what? Tom Riddle's memories that he put in the book. 
But I, I thought memories were always true. No. We can lie to ourselves. We do lie, lie to ourselves. Because what do we remember? The parts that are important. What do we forget? The parts we don't want to remember. There's also distorted perspective. Sure, there's distorted perspective. Because I remember things how? From my perspective. I don't remember things from Ryan's perspective. Why? I don't see it from Ryan's perspective. Which is an interesting kind of dynamic. Because in a later book, book five, we're going to see Harry experience things from certain characters' perspectives, and yet... Ryan's perspective will also be there, and it's kind of like Harry goes into these perspectives of his parents, but he also runs around and sees things from Ryan's But how can that be? If he's dealing with his father's memory, how can he experience his father's memory from Snape's perspective? He can't. <laughs> That's a flaw. She hasn't thought through the ramifications kind of of that experience, okay? So, chapter 7, Mudbloods and Murmurs. What happened previous year's Quidditch Cup? Who won? Slytherin. Slytherin. Why? Okay. So, Wood wants to do what this year? We're going to start practicing early. We're going to practice hard. We're not going to do daily doubles. We're going to do daily triples. You know, He's going to work his team. So they get ready to go out and have their first Quidditch practice. And we're going to skip a bunch. Notice Snape, page 111, gives the Slytherins permission to practice on the Quidditch field or pitch, even though... The Gryffindors already have permission. Okay. Page 112. Who's the new Slytherin seeker? How'd he get on? Right. His father bought him on. Okay. Because he bought the entire Slytherin team new brooms. How did Harry get on the Quidditch team in his first year? How? McGonagall saw him catch the uh, memoir. McGonagall saw him catch the, catch the remember all that Snape had taken. Uh, that Malfoy had taken from Neville. He says, here, catch it if you can. Harry goes into this 50-foot dive and catches it, and she's like, i got to have you on the team. We're going to break all the rules. Why? Because she wants to get back at Snape, showing, you know, the pettiness isn't only among the students. Okay? So Harry becomes the youngest seeker in over 100 years, we are told. His father played seeker, but not when he was first year. So now... Malfoy's a seeker. But notice, Malfoy is made a seeker. What's it mean to be seeker? What's your job? Find and catch the golden snitch. Okay? Is there any, any more than that to it? Well, in the game of Quidditch, no. What about in the quote-unquote game of life? Because this is what Harry is doing. Book one on. That scene in front of the mirror, one of the reasons it's so important is because it shows us Harry seeking. What's he seeking? He's seeking his family. Does he remember his parents at all? No. Has he seen any photographs of his parents? Not until the end of book one, when Hagrid gives him a photo album, and there are his parents. I mean, he sees them in the mirror, yes. That's the first time he ever saw them. Hagrid gives him the photo album so he can now flip through and look at his parents and such. Okay? So, the Slytherin team shows up, and Hermione says, page 112, at least no one on the Gryffindor team had to buy their way in. They got in on pure talent. And Malfoy says, no one asked your opinion, you filthy little mudblood. And all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm. Who's the primary leader of all hell breaking loose? It's not Harry. It's Ron. Why? Because of his... 
tries to put a curse on Malfoy. It backfires because his wand is broken from the Wumpy Willow. Why does Ron do that? Because he likes him, right? It's not aware of it. It's subconscious. You know, he's like, don't you say that about... Okay. That's made by mud blood. Impure muggle. Uh, impure wizard. What's really meant by it? It's a racial slur. Yeah, it's nigger. I mean, it's it's really bad. Okay, she doesn't create this term. By the way, this term comes from the early twentieth century. You know who did regularly use it? The KKK did. She is intentionally drawing a connection between those who use that term and those who use the other term. Born from the mud. Okay. Notice, however, Harry is completely oblivious. Why? He's never heard it before. He's never experienced it before. He hasn't read about it before. It's totally... If Harry had heard the other term I used, what would he say? Oh, it's really bad. Oh, it's really bad. You shouldn't use that. Because he's heard that. Okay? This, totally foreign. He wasn't raised in the wizarding world. Why does Ron react so violently? Because he knows exactly what that is. And notice, not just Ron. Ron and who else? Fred, George, Wood, the entire Gryffindor team go bananas over this. Okay, So, Harry and Hermione get Ron over to Hagrid's hut and they start talking and Hagrid and Harry talk a little bit about um, Lockhart, sorry, brain freeze there for a moment. And Hagrid says some kind of derogatory things about him. And Hermione's a little surprised. Page 115. Hermione says, I think you're being a bit unfair. I mean, Dumbledore thought he was the best man for the job. And Hagrid tells us he was the only man for the job. And I mean the only one getting very difficult to find anyone for the dark arts job. People aren't too keen to take it on these days. Thinking it's jinx. No one's ever last. No one's lasted for a long while now. So tell me, who is he trying to curse? Well, what does that mean? No one's lasted for a long while now. All the dark the arts teachers died. died. Well, the last one died. Do we know what happened to the one before that? No. What about the one before that? We don't know. We are going to find out relatively soon. How long have they been having difficulty keeping the position filled? Since Harry's story? Or since, Harry's since Harry was a year old. Harry's now 12. For 11 years, Dumbledore has had to get a new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher every year. That's why they're starting to think it's jinxed. Okay? Imagine, you know, we have a presidential election, and the president dies in office. Not assassinated, dies. And the vice president becomes president, and a new vice president gets appointed and approved by the Senate, and the president dies, and the vice president becomes president. And it happens every year for 11 years. How many people do you th think, you know, are you going to have 30 Democrats like there currently are setting up to run for president? Probably not, because people are going to start going, Okay, so Ron says what Malfoy said, and Hagrid's like, he didn't, he did. So Ron explains what it means. I mean, like Malfoy's family, top of 116. People who think they're better than everyone else because they're what people call pure blood. I mean, the rest of us know it doesn't make any difference. I look at Neville. He's pure blood. He can hardly stand a cauldron the right way up. Hagrid, and they haven't invented a spell our Hermione can't do. 
Hermione's mud blood, right? Neither parent is magical. And yet she's top of her class. Okay. Ron, it's a disgusting thing to call someone. Dirty blood. See? And what does that take us back to? Bad blood. <coughs> Everyone knows the Malfoys aren't worth it. Common blood. It's ridiculous. Most wizards these days are half-blood anyway. If we hadn't married muggles, we'd have died out. Now, it's kind of interesting. She's writing about this, and we currently have reached such a ass-backwards place in our society that we have somebody running for president, and it's going to be an issue whether or not this person is of Native American descent or not. Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts, because she claims family oral history, she's got Cherokee blood. What did she do last fall? She took a freaking DNA test. And what did it show? She's got one 1,064th. Okay, so is that enough to claim Native American heritage? Is that enough to claim not mud blood? Where does this ideology of pure blood come from? Nietzsche, who I put up on the board the other day, and his notion through Hitler of the Aryan race, the perfect race. How do you get the perfect race? You breed. And you breed all the imperfection out. By the way, in case you're not familiar with it, just throw this out to really piss a bunch of people off. That is the origin of Planned Parenthood. Margaret K. Sanger was a wild eugenicist. Guess who the bad blood was she wanted to breed out? African. Primarily. Also Jewish. Essentially non-white. Okay. I think it's interesting um, the two groups of people's different views on quote-unquote bad blood. For the pure bloods, it's the mixed race or whatever, and then for the muggle-borns, it's just bad blood in face or attitude. Well, yeah, to some extent. But let's take the bad blood for the muggle-born. Let's, let's not ascribe it to the muggle-born. Let's ascribe that solely right now to Hagrid. Because Hagrid's the one who, who says that. We're not told that the Malfoys believe that. And we're not told that Harry believes that. Uh, not the Malfoys, the Weasleys. Okay? Well, I was just going to say, uh, <laughs> Nietzsche uh, hated anti-Semites. So he didn't like, he wouldn't have liked, liked the fact that Hitler misinterpreted his words, and then also... Yeah, Hitler, Hitler very much did, by yeah, the way. Hitler's philosophers interpreted Nietzsche for him and then misrepresented his own words. And a lot of the deri like derivative... Uh, derivative? Stuff that, yeah, that they took from it were from Will to Power. Right. Yeah, which his um, sister's anti-Semitic husband got a hold of and changed his life. And did some editing of Yeah. Yeah. Go back to this for just a moment. Keep keep this idea, okay, in terms of what Hagrid says. So Hagrid has one meaning of it, and the Malfoys have another meaning of it. Okay. What well, I want you to, to you know keep those two impressions in tension to get at what Rowling is possibly suggesting about it. Okay. Um, and, and by the way, um, back to Hitler for a moment. Hitler was quote unquote, I think the number is quarter, quarter Jew. Okay. Voldemort is the purest proponent of pure bloodism. And yet, we will find out later, he's not pure blood wizard. So there's, I mean, there's a clear link from 
Voldemort, at least, to Hitler. And, and we can, well, we will later on, um, talk about some other, even more eerie parallels between Voldemort and Hitler and Voldemort's predecessor, Gellert Grindelwald and uh, Hitler. Okay, so they keep talking, and let's see here. Um, They go back up to the castle, and Harry hears for the first time, Harry hears for the first time a voice, page 120. Nobody else hears it. Um, and that comes at the end of his detention with Lockhart, that he spends signing Lockhart's name to fan letters. Okay, The death day party. Um, we find out Filch is, pages 126 through 28 or so, Filch is a squib. What's a squib? Opposite of a, Opposite of a muggle. person who's born into a magical family, but they don't have any magical abilities. Okay? So they're not magical. Ought to be magical, but not for some reason. What's the death day party that the chapter refers to? The day nearly headless Nick died, which was when? What year? 10, 31, 92. What 92? It's his 500th death day. 1492. Notice that tells us the time frame for this novel. This novel is in 1992. Okay. So the previous novel was set in 1991. Harry was 11 in the previous novel. Harry was born in 1980. His parents died when he was one year old in 1981. Okay. So each one, year one, year two, 93, year three. So the final book occurs in 1997. Okay. This is going to be Important because, okay, this is 1992. What happens 50 years previously? And what year is that? 1942 is when somebody died at Hogwarts. Okay, so uh, gonna skip a little bit. So Harry leaves Lockhart's office again, or excuse me, um, Harry hears more voices. Pages 136, 37, as he's leaving the death day party. He leads Ron and Hermione on a chase through the castle, and they come up to the third floor hallway, page 138, 39. And what do they see? They see writing shining on the wall. The Chamber of Secrets has been opened. Enemies of the air, beware. And then they see something underneath. What? Filch's cat. cat. Mrs. Norris. Frozen. Not literally frozen, but stiff like a dead cat. Ron, let's get out of here. Why? Especially by Filch. Right? I mean, he loves that cat. Harry, shouldn't we try and help? What does every student, seemingly, want to do to Filch's cat? Kick her. Multiple times. Why? Because the cat's a narc. The cat's like a spy. It keeps the students kind of in check. Ron, trust me, we don't want to be found here. Is it just because of the cat that Ron says that? Has something to do with the writing on the wall. Okay. Next chapter, writing on the wall. Who shows up? Filch shows up. Malfoy shows up. Dumbledore shows up. Snape shows up. McGonagall shows up. And Lockhart shows up. And what does Lockhart say? He thinks he can figure out the problem. He can't, obviously. 
Dumbledore tells them the cat's been frozen. She's not dead. She's been petrified. Filch says, ask Harry. Harry says, never touched her. Okay. What does Snape say? You were found. You were here. At the very least, what should happen to Harry? He should be suspended from playing Quidditch. Why? What does Quidditch have to do with the cat being petrified? Snape's on Snape's rooting for the opposing Quidditch team. Essentially, Snape wants his team to win. So get rid of the best seeker that's in any of the four teams. Okay. So Dumbledore says, page one forty-four, innocent until proven guilty, Severus. Where does that come from? Let's say in our world. Louder? Court? Where else? American Constitution? Britain doesn't have a written constitution. But that idea comes from English common law, which predates our common law, or which predates our constitutional law. And yet we are going to see in a later book, they don't have any such law in the wizarding world. How do we know? What happened when Dobby dropped the pudding in the instant accusation? Instant accusation. In fact, it wasn't just instant accusation. I mean, it was you're you know what is grass, buddy. I mean, it was almost like you're guilty of this, right? So let's see here. Um, Hermione's trying to figure out about the Chamber of Secrets. She goes to the library. All the books about Hogwarts are checked out. And who does she ask? Page 149. Professor Benz. I meant to be nearly done with this. She says, what about the Chamber of Secrets? Now, why is Professor Benz important in terms of this question? He's a ghost? He's a history professor. What's his field? History of magic. Chamber of Secrets, if this thing's real, he should know something about it. What does Hermione say to get him to think about the possibility of it being real? Because he keeps saying it's what? It's a myth. It's a legend. But aren't all legends or myths based in some kind of real, true history? And he's like, well, okay. How does he, quote unquote, prove there isn't one? No one has ever found it. It's never been found. And if Dumbledore, he says, can't find it, it must not be real. Okay? Does that solve the problem? Do they stop? No, they don't give up at that point. Okay? They go back to the scene of the crime. And what happens? They see the spiders. We're going to stop with this. They see the spiders leaving. Ron backs away. Why? Why is he terrified of spiders? Did his teddy bear turn into the spider on its own free will? No. How old was Ron when that happened? Three. So they were, is there two years ahead of him? <laughs> Five-year-olds, I'm already capped for a moment, sure. take his teddy bear, take a wand, and they turn it into a living, breathing, crawling, wiggling spider. What kind of magic is that? It's transfiguration, but what kind of magic is that? That's really advanced. <laughs> and they do that when they're five? Okay, so Fred and George ought to be co-ministers of magic at this point. <laughs> or, I'm going to keep doing this. An exaggeration. It's a flaw. It's a flaw in her writing. She doesn't think about that. Later on, when she says, you know, you have to have a wand to do magic. Okay. 
We're not told how Fred and George were able to do this. Even if Fred and George had a wand, they shouldn't have been able to. Why? Because the magic in them is not developed enough in order to be able to do this kind of magic. In this book, it's perfectly fine. It works fine. But it's because of things we discover in later books that you go, she should have fixed that somehow. She needs to come out with a revised edition. Yeah, right. Yeah, people can. And you have people who are what's called, we'll pick up with the rogue blood, blood you're on Wednesday. You have people who are called animagi, that is, they can turn themselves into other things. Okay. Is that McGonagall one of them? Yeah, yes, she is. Yeah.